very interesting thing to do. Um, I, let's see what the next one is. I think it's... Drawing the line. Okay. The, I want to talk about lines. Um, I drew a line into the Gulf of Mexico on my beach that's down at Padre Island, knowing that I could get that line when I went to San Francisco two weeks from then. I was planning to go to a meeting. And not only that, I could get that line anywhere out of a body of water. And I could get it out of the faucet in the kitchen. And so there was a lot of exchange that went on about the line. There were a lot of things that I did with my students with the line. Um, I think um, uh, Anita Valencia, who's here tonight, uh, found that line in the oldest monastery in Kyoto, <laughs> in the well. And we had, we, had, we had put the water, put the line in the water at the blue hole here. And she picked it up in Kyoto. Uh, Al Martin, you know Yes, Al. I knew Al, yes. Al Martin, who advised me to stick to object making, <laughs> <laughs> wrote me a postcard uh, saying he has seen the line. It was circling an, an aircraft carrier as it left the harbor at Nice. Even he saw it. And uh, of course, lines, uh, I, have a, I have a collection of line stories, uh, quite an extensive collection. And the first one, of course, is that line in the sand that Colonel Travis... Mm -hmm. Was it Colonel Travis who did it? Yeah. Um, drew in the Alamo. Oh. And uh, there is a road in New Hampshire that's closed down twice a year. Um, when the snakes migrate. Uh, there's that line that Michael Jackson has around his eyes. I think it's like a tattoo. There are all kinds of lines. Yesterday I read in the paper that it's against the law in uh, Saudi Arabia for a man and a woman to stand in the same line at a place to get food. That's a line story, I think. So. From lines, I went to maps. I don't know. This all happened. Really what, what's time. going on in the photograph on the right there? Well, my students at SAC and I drew a line from here, this X between you and me. That's the center of the earth, right? And we drew, we drew that line to the San Antonio River from SAC. And we do it in various ways. Here we were doing it holding hands. We did it from time to time. I think Betty Ward came in and she drove through the water and made a line with her tires that went on down. And we did a lot of things, including something I wouldn't allow was to pick up some rebar in a, at a, um, a place where they were building something. I wouldn't let that kind of line come in. But we used all kinds of lines to go where we wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of maps, and the maps, I think, led to um, my performance that I call Running to Poteet. Oh, is that coming up next? That's coming up That's next. That's coming up next. Here there it is. is. OK. So um, mm -hmm. I, I heard something on NPR the other day about the science of, of uh, play, and I think I understand that. But at any rate, I was learn I was just beginning to run and whatever it took to to keep me going. And I would run half as far as I could go and I found a talisman on the street and I hid it. And then the next day I came and I picked up that talisman and I ran a little further. And I was careful not to run so far that I wouldn't have enough energy to run home. And <laughs> So eventually, um, Lee Romo and I were running together, and um, she ran with me to, uh, and I took the talisman to um, Half Price Books on Broadway, and I hid the talisman. And then one thing after another, it took me a long time to get back to pick it up, well, bec mainly because Half Price Books opens late and I ran early. 
But finally, I went back there, and my, my talisman was still there. It was behind this book called Art as Energy. <laughs> so I picked it up, and I ran it to the San Antonio Museum of Art, mm -hmm. where I hid it and left it until I had time to run. Where did you it hide up. it? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've forgotten. But it, it was here for a couple of weeks. And then I came, I came and picked it up. And there again, I had to run kind of late because the museum didn't open at 6 o'clock. And I took it to the Alamo. And then I picked that one up, and I took it to Mission San Jose. And I was thinking, well, that's about all the you know, important places in my life. And I was always careful that I didn't run so far that I didn't have enough energy to run home. But then I got to thinking about, I had never been to the Poteet Strawberry Festival. And so I talked Lee into, we started training for that. <laughs> and we ran to Poteet. Now, we, we didn't run very fast. So Lee could told me the whole history of Russia on that trip. <laughs> That's a long history. But finally, we came up behind the parade, and we stopped. And, and we'd only gone 23 miles. It's 25 miles to Poteet. But Lee was ready to stop because she'd given her kidney to her daughter less than a year before. I was so high that I could have gone at least two more miles or whatever it took. Anything for art. And so <laughs> we, um, we had strawberry shortcake on the <laughs> And we got a ride home. Well, that was fortunate. I'd so say. I had finally gone so far that I couldn't ride home. That's significant. It signaled the culmination of the project, I would imagine. Well, yeah. and also other things. <laughs> let's, let's move on to other okay. things. Tell us about oh, well, um, this... Marilyn and the law. Okay. <laughs> I have a friend who, has a, who had a resale shop, and she called me and said, I have your gun. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't believe in guns. I, I don't want a gun. He said, but, but this is a lady's revolver, and it has loose side handles. It has a rose on one side, and it has a cursive Marilyn on the other side. <laughs> and I thought, well, I guess it is mine, and I bought it. And I didn't know what to do with it, because I really don't like having guns around. And so it took me maybe several years before I figured out. But you know, in Gothic novels, um, what you want to hide, you cut out the book and hide it in there and put it on the top shelf. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And nobody knows until they solve the mystery. Well, I, I did that. And I showed it once. And then I put it on the top shelf. I had, at that time, I had a, a bookcase with a ladder that was about two and a half stories high. <laughs> and I hid it up there because you know, I had little children, and I didn't want them to find that gun. And it wasn't until I moved from there 20 years later that I found out that they knew where it was and they had shown it to every kid that came in the house. I didn't really know that. Very good. Okay, let's move on because we have a lot of okay. proof to cover, Marilyn. So um, in the 1980s then, you started making these um, lead, uh, these blouses and other yes. articles of mm -hmm. clothing like the one we have in our collection. Tell us, um, where did the idea come from? What was your process? What were you intending with the body of work? Well, the idea came from the fact that my brother is an architect and he bring me, brought me a little piece of lead, sheet lead, mm -hmm. and he said, here, I think you'll like this. And I said, oh, I'm going to make designer lead blouses out of that. I mean, I just It was sort of an instantaneous idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I made some of these before I moved to New York and some when I lived in New York and some when I came back from New York. And um, actually, I had sewed in my lifetime um, because I wanted to wear designer clothes. <clears throat> and uh, the way to do that was to get a pattern and make the dress. But I always was awkward about it. I would take out and I'd follow the pattern and I'd take it out and I'd sew it again. And so it wasn't really until I started using lead 
as my material that I could sew with grace and ease. <laughs> And these are commemorative in um, some way? They, they represent um, certain people, often me, and um, they're, um, they're always a little smaller than life size. Mm -hmm. They are um, heavy. And then, of course, I began to realize that they're dangerous. And, uh, but I, you know, I always did wear gloves, and if I burned myself, I didn't work till I had healed. But uh, all of those things, I think we often disguise ourselves the way we want to appear in the world. And I have to admit this, somebody who sent me a corsage in honor of the occasion. Do you think I would wear a corsage? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so they, they do represent well, I had an exhibition in um, Dallas, and I had invited the editor of the newspaper at the, where they sell clothing there, what's it called? In, in Dallas, the, the Mart. Apparel. Yeah, Apparel Mart. Oh. And so the, I can't do that. <laughs> editor, the editor and his photographer came to the opening, and I said, well, I see you have on your lead blouses. They didn't know what I was talking about, of course, because they had on khaki-colored pants, navy blue jacket, and a rip tie, rip stripe tie. They were dressed the way they should be dressed. And uh, so a lot of it had to do with that, I think. OK, you made a big decision in yes. 1986 that obviously uh, changed your life in a significant way. You moved to New York City. Yes. What, what brought that on? Oh, well, I was just moving to Mecca. And, you know, I had always meant to move to Mecca, and I did. And, and you uh, lived in a loft, which you, uh, everyone yeah. can see there, which was a real change from a home in San Antonio. Well, yeah, from my big house in San Antonio. But uh, later, we painted the walls and, and uh, built a little ki uh, kitchen, and I slept on that balcony up there. I had a, an old ladder to climb down. Um, and then you, you landed a position at a gallery? At the Bernice Steinbaum Gallery. And so this picture is Bernice and uh, my cohorts and uh, Miriam Shapiro and Faith Ringo. Who, of I course, had, are major figures in the Yeah, I had met them movement. earlier. Uh, when they came here for the uh, Artist Quil and the Quilt, the quilt Show. show. Mm -hmm. It just turned out that we had the, the inaugural exhibit was at the McNay. But that show traveled for four years and ah. it's very popular. Um, mm -hmm. So I already knew a number of women when I moved to New York. And Faith became my good friend and I wanted to mention that because obviously her storytelling was influential mm -hmm. on me. We'd go somewhere, and she'd say, did you see that old man hitting on that girl back there? And, and then she had this whole story that she had made up just from this glance. And uh, I was already telling stories, but I didn't uh, call it art. And I just told it for entertainment's sake. And uh, there's always a lot of storytelling in my family, especially from my father. And um, I didn't know it was art, or it could be art. And, uh, but I entertained my cohorts at the gallery. And I have a friend from Iowa who moved there right after graduate school. And she said, I wish we had interesting stories like that in Iowa. And I said, well, yes, you do. And she said, no, we don't. <laughs> So, you know, that's when now, I realized... speaking of storytelling, let's, let's move into yeah. this. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's when I realized that my stories were exotic to people in these foreign places. <laughs> now, this is a picture of, or several pictures of my father, who was the storyteller in the family. And, um, you know, Milan Kundero talks about the... Uh, the um, struggle of memory against forgetting. And so somebody has to keep the stories. 
and I think I must be the storyteller now. The storyteller keeper. Yeah. Story keeper. Now, I have two daughters, and I overheard them arguing one day about who got to be the storyteller after I'm gone. <laughs> so it will and, continue. Uh, those are the two daughters that they're in the picture? Those are the one daughter's children. One daughter, the grandchildren yeah, in the my, picture? Yeah, okay. my granddaughter is here. And, back here and somewhere. And then daddy is your father? My correct? father. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I videotaped this. I wish I had uh, videotaped more of his stories. But this one is about snakes and the medicine show. And if we go to the next picture, this is the piece I made about that. The one on the, is that on the left? Yeah. Um, is daddy's chair, a corner chair person to be worn by two members of the family. Now in the performance, the two members of the family, as you see on the right, have to look like they're members of the family. They have to look alike. And uh, I tie their legs together. We'll go to the next one and we can see. This is part of a performance. This was a performance that took place in New York. Yeah, in um, Long Island University. And I tie their legs together. I build a little house <coughs> with boards. And then I tie their legs together, and they fit themselves into the first corner. And they and tell Daddy's famous funny story. And did they have to rehearse for this? Did, uh, how did um, this work? They do rehearse, but it's ad lib. Okay. I tell them the story, and more than they ever want to know about the story. <laughs> and, and they bring in their, you'd be surprised how many people have an Aunt Mabel. <laughs> All of the actors that I've ever used have had an Aunt Mabel. <laughs> um, and they bring in there, they tell it, and actually they tell the same story in each of the four corners of the house. And as you can see, they're moving around in, yeah. in the performance. By the time they get to the third corner, they're having a little argument about whether it was rattlesnakes or water moccasins. And then they argue about whether it was a Model A or a Model T. The very last thing they do in the fourth corner is to um, give each other a little peck on the cheek so that you realize that it's a sharing of the story that's important, not the details. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the details are important to me, and this is choreographed, more or less. And, um, but um, their story <laughs> is ad lib. This is another chairperson. I have a whole family of chairpersons. This is a Confessions of a Pew Person. Baptist, of course, to be worn by six members of the family. So I'm the one in the red hat, and um, that's, let's see, which one is that? That's my mother, that's my Aunt Marjorie, and that's my father, and my brother, and my son. That's not really my son. Actually, my son, not Dan, but another son saw that performance one night. And afterwards, I said, well, what did you think? And he stood up and, I mean, he said, well, you got the story all wrong. And I said, I wish you'd stood up in the middle of the performance and challenged me on that. <laughs> but each one of these comes out individually. And um, I tell the story of when they use their first bad word. And, um, and then with a series, about four or five things, they attach each other, like the changing of the guard. And then they all turn and look at the next person who's coming out. And then I tell about them. And then the next one. Um, I, when my Aunt Marjorie came out, I had asked her when, I remember when I used my first bad word. But I asked Marjorie if she remembered when she used her first bad word. And she told me about having a hissy fit on the front porch when she couldn't go out in the fields with her dad. And I did a piece about that later. I don't know if we're going to come across it. We need to keep moving, yeah. so let's keep moving. So this is a mantle <laughs> to keep him cool, a mantle to keep him warm. So this is about my little uncle who died when he was three. And uh, I said cool because this was Central Texas and it's harder to stay cool than it is to stay warm. So that's a mantle of So politics. from this point on, most of your work really does have a story associated with it. Very much a yeah. story. Mm -hmm. 
this one is a pedestal as a shelf to be installed down low where the children can reach it. And a fur further title is we didn't know but that we were poor because we always had our mother's bosom to enfold us. That's a quote from Alvin Ailey. Are you fond of theater then? I mean, uh, oh. these works uh, now seem to have, you know, the influence of staging and yeah. costuming and mm -hmm. those elements. I think that especially August Wilson was a big influence on mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. because he tells these family stories that are quite involved and then the next play is another family story. And didn't you mention Horton Foote? At one and time? Horton Foote, <laughs> yes, right. And um, um, those stories, elaborate stories. My um, father used to tell really elaborate stories that went on and on. I didn't, I didn't get any of that from him, but uh, <laughs> my ex-husband couldn't stand those stories. They lasted so long, but I loved them. As they go on and on, and you can learn all kinds of interesting things. Um, and these wall works, tell us about these. Oh, okay. These are, um, uh, oh, what are they? They're from the um, Woman Shapes the House series. That is, they are never a rectangle. They always have some offshoot, irregular shape. Irregular mm -hmm. shape, because my theory was that the woman is the one who shapes the house. The one on the right is uh, an apron shape. And I did about five or six of those, and each one represented a particular person. This one represents Glenna Park, who many of you know. And um, um, I made them from little uh, embossed sheets of lead, little pieces of lead that my dentist saved for me. I showed him what I was doing with them, and he didn't say.